I'm in the countryside outside the northern Ugandan town of Gulu on my way to see a government project for former rebels of the notoriously brutal Lord's Resistance Army. I'm with Captain Ray Apire, a former rebel commander. Ah, so this is the farm. Is this Labora Captain farm? Apire came home in 2004 after 17 years as an influential LRA leader. Like other rebel commanders, he's been granted amnesty in an effort to help bring peace to this region. We have denounced rebellion. We have left the gun. We have come to to handle us. The conflict in the north began 20 years ago as a conventional anti-government rebellion, but it soon mutated into something altogether different, backed by the Sudanese government across the border. The LRA are led by self-styled prophet Joseph Kony. He says he wants to rule Uganda by the Biblical Ten Commandments. This year, for the first time in over a decade, the government and the LRA are involved in serious peace talks. The security situation in the north has now improved dramatically, but the conflict isn't over yet and its consequences are still felt. At the height of the insecurity, close to two million people were driven from their homes into overcrowded, displaced camps. The UN calls this one of the world's worst humanitarian disasters. But it's the children who suffered most. The LRA is known for abducting new recruits. Boys as young as 10 have been kidnapped, given guns and forced to commit atrocities. I've been reporting in this region for 12 years, but the stories these children tell never fail to shock. Bosco Nier was abducted when he was 11 and stayed with the rebels for four years. One day, one of our friends tried to escape, and when he was caught, he was hacked to death. We ourselves were forced to chop them. Even I had to do it. I was forced to do it. How did you feel about that? I can't forget it. Even now I have nightmares about it where I feel myself killing again. Over the past decade, rehabilitation centres like this one help children who escape from the LRA come to terms with their experience. A trauma counsellor divides them into rebels, government troops and civilians so they can reenact a rebel raid as part of their therapy. This boy pretends to be a rebel commander, preparing his troops for battle. He sprinkles them with holy water to protect them from bullets. The children are susceptible to the supernatural beliefs that underlie the LRA. Many remain convinced that the rebel leader, Joseph Kony, has real spiritual powers. LRA battles have always been bloody, with fighters forbidden to take cover. The rebels abducted adults, but they've always preferred children. Over 20,000 have been taken since the war began. Girls become wives to rebel commanders. Many returned home with children. When I was 14, I was given to a commander as his wife. What was he like? Can you just, was, he, was he good to you? How was he to you? Rag. He was bad. <laughs> when I didn't want to sleep with him, he'd beat me and he'd force me to sleep with him. It was the same for all the girls. The LRA is staggeringly brutal. Michael was mutilated by a rebel commander who accused him of being a government soldier. In fact, Michael was a primary school student, but his pleading was ignored. The two of you just go tie the man back and get the, the very sharp panga. The machete? Yes, hey, sharp panga. And the, the rotor blade. Just begin cut them up and here, and then 
put his, his finger into into the big tree and cut off and and let leave the man there and just tell him that they go to the village and told the people that whenever he be any anybody come to the to the village they they will do the same thing to them so they were making an example of you they cut yes. your lips and your ears and your fingers and yes. they wanted you to go back and tell people yes Civilians have borne the brunt of this conflict. Until last April, roads were insecure and aid agencies used military escorts to get around. A population of peasant farmers have been displaced into camps like these. Some are now venturing out to till their land, but many still rely on food handouts to survive. There's not enough water or medicine, there's nothing for people to do, and until recently, it wasn't even safe. When I visited this camp earlier in the year, rebels had just been to this woman's house, seized her and her daughter, and forced them to carry looted property. She was released, but her 13-year-old daughter wasn't. How was her daughter when she left? Was she okay? When they released me, she was already far away. I'm so sorry, madam. This was the second time the child had been abducted. Her mother knew the LRA routinely kill children who escape and are recaptured. When a person, an abductee, escapes, it is just a regulation in the LRA that that person should be killed. So if you escape and you are re-arrested, you will be killed. Jackson Achama was a major in the LRA. He explains the rationale behind such atrocities. And usually the person who is arrested after he has escaped will be uh, killed in front of the abductees to instill fear in them so that they don't what, escape. I met Major Achama and other former rebel commanders in the main hotel in Gulu town. They've returned home in the last two years after being captured or surrendering. How many did they lose? Many. Captain Rea Pire preached the LRA's religious gospel. Really? And how many did you lose? Brigadier Michael Achella Madong was once Joseph Coney's chief escort. Brigadier Kenneth Banya was the LRA leader's senior advisor. So how do they explain the abduction of children? Jesus also abducted people. People never wanted to, to, to join Jesus willingly. So he also abducts people because the kingdom of God uh, calls for everybody. So anybody who is found, he just abducts. Jesus Christ says, go and teach. Go and abduct. He said go and abduct? Yes. I don't remember that it, being it, in the Bible. Jesus Christ said, you are no, lo no longer going to be fishermen, but you are going to catch people instead of fish. But don't you think he meant their souls? He didn't mean physically capture them <laughs> and tie them with a rope. That's and mean abducting. Them. <laughs> did, did you have abducted girls as your wives? As your wives? You had several wives, didn't you? Yes. Abducted girls? Yes, I have them as my wives. Uh, they are even with me up to now. They stayed with you when you came out of the bush? Yes, up to now they are always with me. Did you feel bad taking an abducted wife as an abducted girl as your wife? A girl that was just kidnapped and... You see, love is built. Huh? When you have built love uh, between you and the abductee, all of, you, all, of, all, all of us are abductees. I was also abducted, she was also abducted. Now there came a convergence where she was given to me as a wife. If we build our love, we can continue to live. There's no problem. And what about Joseph Coney, the rebel leader? These men once worked alongside him. He claims he is a prophet sent by God. Do you believe that? I mean, do you believe he has that power? Uh, the, the spiritual power was exercised and uh, I do believe that he had the spirit. Do you think Joseph Kony is a godly man? What he predicted comes true. But mostly, he is from God. 
I don't understand how he can be from God and yet do such terrible things like abduct children and harm people so terribly. You know, when God wants to return people back to him, he punishes them. Usually God punishes people when he wants them to return to him. So by making people suffer, the LRA is bringing people closer to God? Yes. It's strange to hear the LRA defended with these bizarre biblical interpretations, particularly as Joseph Coney now presents himself as a freedom fighter. Until this year, the Rebel Lords Resistance Army was a closed organisation, hostile to journalists. I'm flanking you from behind. You were flanking me from behind. I didn't know that at the time. I felt secure at mile 41 because I had the Sudanese rebels around me. It's something that's brought home to me when Michael Achella Madong, who used to be Joseph Kony's chief escort, described how he was sent by the rebel leader to abduct me when I was reporting here in 1997. What would have happened if you'd caught me? I will take you to the boss because he is the one who gave me the order that you go and bring I know that uh, Anna Bujolo is a journalist, he's now in the field, bring him alive, don't shoot him, don't kill him, but I want him alive with me here. Then we went, we went very near you, about 150-200 meters. After that, the deputy of Coin communicated to me, no, you leave that, that is an international journalist. What would have happened if you'd caught me? If we got you, by that time, we will send you to the headquarter where Kony is. And then what? I don't know from you. I'd always imagined these commanders would be incoherent evil men. But despite any atrocities they may have committed, they're articulate, even charming, and they insist they too are victims of this war. The former commanders are living freely in Uganda thanks to an amnesty law. Six years ago, the Ugandan government offered the amnesty to all LRA fighters, partly to encourage the leadership to come back home. Seasoned officers, child abductees, wives with their babies, all have been eligible for a document exempting them from prosecution for crimes committed in the bush. Yes, uh, the amnesty came about as a demand from the people because this war has dragged on for a long time and the people felt that if we can forgive uh, the, the rebellions in the north and uh, forgive them and ask them to come out maybe the war will come to an end. Mary Adong is the Gulu head of the Amnesty Commission. Her job involves welcoming back former fighters who escaped or are captured. These girls were briefly abducted and used as porters. The LRA has always warned recruits like these they'll be killed if they come home. Mary assured them they'd be safe. Many fighters learned about the amnesty from this radio station, Mega FM. They broadcast a program, Come Back Home, to convince rebels to surrender. Commanders like Ray Apire called out to their former colleagues by name. Ray himself returned home after hearing his wife, who he'd sent ahead, give a coded message of assurance over the airwaves. And in turn, he was heard. They said, uh, Banya and other commanders, you come out. The government has given amnesty and the people of Achille has forgiven us. If you come, there's no problem. Did you believe it when you heard it on the At radio? At first I couldn't, but I got encouraged because I trusted Ray from the bush and these commanders. So I knew they were not deceiving me. So I, that's, I decided to come.
thousands of former fighters have been granted amnesty. Many were forced out of the bush by increased military pressure and the fact that the Sudanese government withdrew its support. Hundreds have gone on to join the Ugandan army. This entire battalion is made up of ex-LRA. The army says these former rebels make good soldiers. The LRA are brutal, but their troops are disciplined, used to following orders on pain of death. They have adapted very, very quickly. Human beings, as I said, are very easy to change. Uh, this were young people. Uh, I said they are very quick learners. Um, the problem that they had in the past was leadership. So with good leadership, um, they are actually very, very, very obedient and very, very disciplined soldiers. Um, Brigadier Sam Koro has been the spokesman for the LRA. Brigadier Kolo's job was to defend the LRA. He came out of the bush last year after Joseph Kony turned against him. Are you surprised at how easily you've been welcomed back? These were your bitterest enemies. No, I'm saying we are Ugandans. You mark this, we are Ugandans. So it is not really being bitter, but if we fought, but then overnight we become friends. I think that is amazing. You cannot get that kind of spirit in, in, in the world, maybe, because the, the, the culture of Africa, especially in Uganda, is different. So you cannot buy that, you cannot buy that kind of culture to be imposed on Uganda. The legislation of the amnesty law, the policy of reconciliation, it's this what you are seeing in practice. And even the culture of actually. Yes, and then, yeah. The, there is no word of revenge. They, they are they, sure. The revenge is not there in the... In the in very the, lucky for you, Brigadier Kolo. Isn't not it? really <laughs> lucky, not really lucky. You have benefited not, from not that. Not really lucky, not even being of luck, but that is now the culture, the customary, you know, the, com the customary regulation that had been from the beginning of the creation of the world, that there is no forgive, there is no revenge in actually. There is an impressive show of forgiveness here in the north. People have lived side by side with former fighters for years. This bicycle taxi driver in Gulu town told me he'd been kidnapped and taken to the bush. There are so many like him, abductees, forced to commit atrocities, now trying to live a normal life back home. But even if they've been granted amnesty, do men like Major Jackson Achama feel responsible for their actions? Kony is the only one responsible for issuing orders and nobody objects. Do you feel responsible for any bad things that you did? Uh, actually, I don't feel responsible. Because if, he, if it was a kind of command structure where, whereby people could just uh, sit down and discuss uh, uh, operational strategies and military strategies, then I could feel that I was a, a, a bad participant. But People only wait to take orders from him, that is all. Sometimes it says the spirit has said, do this. Then you cannot negotiate with the spirit, say orders. So should the line be drawn at Joseph Kony? Should he be lured out of the bush with the offer of amnesty or made to pay for his crimes? There's always been a tension, an underlying tension between peace and justice in northern Uganda. But recently this came to the fore after the International Criminal Court issued arrest warrants against the top five rebel commanders. The ICC ruling means that if Kony comes out, he should, under international law, be tried for war crimes. And while this satisfies a need to make someone pay for the LRA atrocities, it also means the peace talks keep faltering. So what's more important, ensuring a handful of men face an international court or letting them off the hook in the hope of bringing peace to millions. Remarkably, many in the North, even some of the worst affected victims, say they are ready to forgive. They cannot be punished them because they want, they, we want just them, them to come, come out from the bush. So you could forgive them? Yes, I, we can forgive them because they want just uh, to be in peace. You can forgive them even though they have done terrible things to you. You yes. can still forgive them. Yes.
Perhaps this is down to a culture of forgiveness, but more likely it's the cry of a people desperate for peace.